Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Europe podcast, available every morning on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. It's Thursday, the 12th of September in London. I'm Caroline Hepke. Coming up today, the core issue, traders and economists scrap expectations of a half-point rate cut from the Fed after core U.S. inflation ticks up. Round two, in doubt, Donald Trump insists that he won his debate with Kamala Harris, but says he's unsure about a rematch. And China crackdown. Investment bankers are in the sights of Beijing. Staff at state-owned brokerages are told to hand over their passports. Let's start with a roundup of our top stories. Swaps traders are fully pricing in a 25 basis point Fed cut for next week's meeting. The market moves come as August core inflation in the US came in hotter than expected, with the gauge 0.3% higher than in July. JP Morgan Asset Management's chief global strategist, David Kelly, says it shows there's no need for drastic action. I think the Fed must be aware that, that if they go aggressive here, they're in danger of undermining consumer confidence. And honestly, the economy is doing exactly what they want it to do. It is settling into a softer expansion, a slower expansion. That's what they want. So they only have to gradually return to normal and in interest rates. Kelly and other market analysts are calling an end to weeks of speculation about a larger reduction being on the cards. City economists scrapped their forecast for an outsized US rate reduction, though Goldman's David Solomon said that there's still a case for a larger cut. Meanwhile, the ECB will probably cut its key rate by 25 basis points to 3.5% at its meeting later today. That's according to all 68 economists surveyed by Bloomberg on the decision. Bloomberg Economics says that members may also revise down their GDP and inflation forecasts for Europe. Markets are betting that there will be at least two moves this year, especially with the Federal Reserve poised to begin loosening US monetary policy next week. Donald Trump says that he is not inclined to debate Democratic rival Kamala Harris again following Tuesday evening's contest. The Republican nominee, who initially suggested several additional matchups with the vice president, said that he won the debate, quote, by a lot. But speaking after his performance, the former president left the door open for future events. When a fighter has a bad fight, gets knocked out or loses the fight, the first thing he says is, we want a rematch. When a fighter has a bad fight, gets knocked out or loses the fight, the first thing he says is, we want a rematch. Donald Trump there. A month ago, Trump floated three debates with Harris, which included the one already held with ABC News and further debates to be hosted by Fox News and NBC News. Now, immediately following that event, the Harris campaign said that the vice president was ready for a second debate. To China and a widening crackdown. At least three top investment bankers from different securities firms have been detained by Chinese authorities since August. Now Bloomberg understands that several state-backed brokerages are asking their employees to hand in their passports and seek permission for travel following private guidance from Chinese regulators. Our chief North Asia correspondent Stephen Engel says the incidents are just the latest under President Xi Jinping's long-running common prosperity campaign. There's been multiple stresses, but this is the latest. Uh, we're hearing from sources that investment bankers, essentially in the crosshairs right now, at least three top investment bankers uh, from different securities firms uh, have been detained by authorities. One of them uh, used to oversee deal making at Haitong Securities, allegedly fled the country uh, about two weeks ago, has since been arrested and repatriated. Bloomberg Stephen Engel speaking there. Sources say some employees were told that regulators are scrutinising initial public offerings and other capital raising activities. China's $1.7 trillion brokerage industry and domestic capital markets activities have already slowed sharply while the broader economy has sputtered. Commerzbank Bank is preparing its defence for a possible Unicredit takeover. The German bank, which was recently surprised by Unicredit's disclosure of a 9% stake, is expected to try and build political backing for a rejection of the approach. Unicredit CEO Andrea Orsell has been eyeing Commerzbank Bank as a potential target. He spent three years looking for a transformative deal for Italy's Unicredit. All of this based on Bloomberg interviews with seven people familiar 
familiar with the process. Now, if the merger is successful, Orcel will oversee the biggest bank by revenue in Germany. NVIDIA's Jensen Wong says that his customers are more frustrated than they used to be. The boss of the AI mega cap told a tech conference that the limited supply of NVIDIA's latest chips was causing tensions. Delivery of our components and our technology and our infrastructure and software is really emotional for people because it directly affects their revenues, it directly affects their competitiveness. And so we probably have more emotional customers today, and deservedly so. And if we could fulfill everybody's need, then the emotion would go away. But it's very emotional. It's, it's really tense. We've got a lot of responsibility on our shoulder, and we're trying to do the best we can. Jensen Wong, well, when the NVIDIA CEO was asked if the massive spends on AI were proving and providing a return, he said that companies have no choice other than to embrace accelerated computing. The chipmaker's shares have more than doubled this year following a 239% run-up in 2023. In a moment, we're going to discuss that ECB rate decision after the US inflation data that we got out yesterday that shifted uh, the Fed rate cut bets in the market, plus also a special report on UK prisons that I want to bring to you. But first, let's talk about 100-hour work weeks. Bank of America and JP Morgan Chase are rolling out measures that may ease junior bankers' workloads amid complaints across the industry that weekly hours are increasingly creeping up past that 100-hour um, uh, number. JP Morgan, according to Wall Street Journal, um, is going to try to limit the work week to 80 hours. Bank of America also has a new tool to try to track junior bankers, a kind of diary about how they they spend their time exactly. On the Bloomberg Terminal, you can read much more about it. Um, if it sounds familiar, well, it is. I mean, Bloomberg wrote a story on this in June about the stress mounting for junior bankers and also staffers, which is the kind of rung just above uh, the junior bankers. At that time, that was because banks were coming out of a deal slump. They, they've got lower head count, but still a lot of ambitions to try to kind of um, get new deals in the door. And there had been, of course, really tragically two junior bankers who died in May. And so a big debate across the industry about whether workloads are just too often too unhealthy for people. So really interesting that two banks on Wall Street coming out with these new measures now in September to try to uh, control, at least have better oversight of the hours of junior, junior bankers. Anyway, you can read that story on the terminal this morning. Now, the bond market has ended its flirtation with the idea that the Federal Reserve would cut interest rates by a half point this month. Core US inflation increased by 0.3% in August from the prior month. And the three-month annualised rate, we learned, uh, did also hot up too to 2.1%. All of this ahead of the ECB meeting today. Let's bring in Bloomberg Opinion columnist Daniel Moss for more on this story. Good morning, Dan. Great to speak to you. Um, markets have been grappling with the size of the Fed's potential rate cut really for months. What is the thinking now that we have that CPI inflation report out and the Fed path ahead? Markets are indicating there is a significantly diminished prospect of a half point cut next week. There'll still be a cut, but traders reckon it will be just a quarter point. I was never really convinced of the case for a half point Historically, absent a crisis, there's no crisis here. The Fed has a tendency uh, to begin in modest increments, see how things go, and then they can accelerate from here. So yeah, I always took that with a bit of the half point narrative with a little dose of salt. Yeah, absolutely. Um and also, in, in terms of the ECB, though, they've already cut cut in June. Another cut today is being priced in. I mean, there was no talk of 50 for Europe, really. What happens after that, though, is a lot less clear. What's your view on that? Well, it may be clearer today uh, than it was in June. Now, Christine Lagarde <clears throat> has emphasised at a number of press conferences over the past 12 months that she's not really in the forward guidance business anymore. And you sort of got the impression after the June cut that they'd convinced themselves they had to do it, so they did it, but maybe they wish they hadn't been, you know, quite so soon. 
now a cut from the ECB is more in the mainstream of where central banks are going and have indicated they will go. Mm. She may feel a bit more confident now uh, in <clears throat> projecting additional reductions. Of course, there'll be the usual thing like, you know, we're sovereign and, you know, we don't just follow the Fed and all the rest of it. But the reality is the trend is the same. Uh, yeah. So let's see. We may get a bit more from her today on what the future looks like than was the case in June. Yeah. You've written many pieces, though, about how, you know, we're all on planet, planet Federal Reserve. Um, and indeed, you, you wrote a piece about the dollar that I think is also quite relevant today. Very sceptical about yuan bulls that you know, the strength of the um, dollar re really remains, even though th there has been a big play into Asian FX markets. OK, so when I wrote that piece last week, what yeah. I was wrestling with was, look, China's uh, currency, which had been fairly beaten up, uh, had erased its losses for the entire previous 12 months. OK, but at the same time, the news on China's economy has gotten progressively worse. And no one's talking about the People's Bank of China hiking interest rates. They've been talking for some time about the opposite. And indeed, the PBOC has trimmed its main rate cautiously uh, in tiny increments over the past 12 to 18 months. So all of a sudden, why is mm. the yuan looking relatively, you know, perkish? The answer is, it's nothing to do with China. It's to do with the Fed. And if you look at the big moves in the Chinese yuan uh, towards strengthening, they yeah. basically followed the July FOMC press conference and the Jackson Hole speech by Jay Powell. Now, you can say to yourself, okay. well, sure, that just puts China's currency in the pack with everyone else except the dollar is the currency of China's number one strategic competitor. So all the stuff we've had rammed down our throats in the past three decades about China's rise and da 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 well, something as core and as precious as your currency policy is to an unhealthy degree dictated by your rival we hope doesn't one day become an open enemy. But you see where I'm going with this. There's a contradiction there. How can China really be comfortable with that? Yeah. And so in terms of the thinking then, if we flow from, from the yuan and the kind of issue with China into the yen, that also has been making big moves more recently in the last couple of days. Yes, it's very interesting. Uh, now, the yen is having an epic rally this mm. quarter. Uh, it's on course for its biggest three-month gain in years. Now, if I'm reading the data correctly, I'll just hedge myself. If I'm reading it correctly, it could be the biggest quarterly gain uh, in more than a decade. So something profound is going on here. It's not just the Fed. This is what's interesting. It's not just the Fed. The Fed is a big player in this move. But just as Jay Powell has been talking more dovishly, Kazuo Ueda, his counterpart at the Bank of Japan, has been talking more hawkishly. So the gap in interest rates between the two of them is coming under pressure from both ends. And I would also add, Carolyn, there's a bit of an unsung almost hero in this, and that is the Ministry of Finance and its approach to currency intervention. Now... It would not have generated a rally of anything like the degree we've seen without Powell and without Wader, but they've picked strategic moments to intervene. They've put a floor under the currency at pretty sensitive moments. And, you know, the lesson here is, uh, you know, governments still do matter. So in they the early 2000s, you know, I was working where you are in London, running the currency desk, and everyone said intervention doesn't work. It's destined to fail. Well, maybe there are instances where it can be an ingredient in a successful story.
Okay. Dan, thank you so much for being with me this morning. Bloomberg Opinion Columnist Daniel Moss, always great to speak to you. Now to uh, one of our big news stories on the terminal this morning. The UK's overcrowded prisons have forced the government into an early release scheme, which has been in the news. On Tuesday, 1,700 prisoners were freed to reduce pressure on the system in a huge gamble by Keir Starmer's new government. Joining us now to discuss this is Bloomberg's UK economy reporter Tom Rees, who's been investigating this Tom this story has been a huge news story in the UK for weeks but I want you just to rewind and explain why UK prisons are actually so full so it really all dates back to the 1990s when um, the Tory Home Secretary at the time um, Michael Howard made this famous speech where he declares prison works um, and that that turns out to be a, a, a turning point for policy in the UK under governments of all stripes um, you know, since since then, you know, the UK has seen the biggest increase in its incarceration rate in Western Europe. Um, so we've seen sentences, you know, custodial sentences double in the last 20 years. So that's just ramped up the, the prison population. You know, even though mm. it's not that more crimes are being committed, it's just we're sending people um, to prison for longer. Um, and then that's that's collided with strains in the whole judicial system from COVID and austerity. So the mm. numbers in prison on, on remand, so those waiting for, for trial, has skyrocketed because of uh, court backlogs. So when, when you put it all together, it's just led to... The actual numbers of um, people in prison um, doubling since since the nineties, and yeah. you know we have a very old and uh, you know outdated prisoner state here, which just couldn't cope. Yeah, absolutely. We're heading towards what hundred thousand prisoners. There has been a clear change though from this new government when it comes to law and order issues. As a result, I mean, for one, the riots this summer, but also because of their philosophy on rehabilitation. I mean, re releasing prisoners though is obviously politically dangerous for Keir Starmer explain how though so the, the Labour government are in a real bind on this so the simplest and most cost effective way of solving this problem is by releasing prisoners early and reducing the length of custodial sentences now get, get, guess what uh, the, the public don't like that <laughs> uh, yes. polling suggests that the, the, the vast majority of the public actually think that prison sentences despite doubling in the last 20 years um, are not harsh enough um, so the the government is building more prison places. You know, the, um, the last government had a, a plan for another twenty thousand prison places, but that works mm-hmm. delayed. And MOJ projections expect you know the prison population to soar even higher. Um, so it's it's quite hard to see the, the yeah. kind of politically astute way of getting out of this. Yeah, absolutely, and especially when you know you listen to. Um, commentators or former prison governors, for example, who say, look, the, the reoffending rate of people who leave prison is 25 to 30 percent in the UK. So, you know, if you release them a few months early or later, that that reoffending rate sort of stands. Then the solution for this, can this be solved by more money? I mean, there's also a staffing crisis in prisons, for example. Is there going to be more money in the budget for this? Um, yeah, so the, the tricky thing is, is that Chancellor Rachel Reeves is very much preparing a, a, a belt tightening budget um, for October 30th and has been as- actually asking departments to find savings. So she may spare the MOJ um, some of the pain, but, you know, this this is a department that, you know, in the past was very hit hard by in the austerity era. Mm. It's not one of these protected departments like, you know, the NHS or education, which is usually, you know, spared real terms, spending cuts. Um, yeah. So... The MOJ already has quite a lot of catching up to do. And, you know, g- given the backlash to some of these early savings that Reeves has found, like, the, you know, the winter fuel allowance, which has been an absolute uh, car crash um, for her, it's it's going to be really tricky to find um, the money for mm. prisons. Um, but, you know, yeah. um, as we see, the, the crisis might, you know, necessitate it. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, your morning brief on the stories making news from London to Wall Street and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed every morning on Apple, Spotify and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning on London DAB Radio, the Bloomberg Business app and Bloomberg.com. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day, right here on Bloomberg Daybreak Europe.